I hope that you know that the work of the Women's Leadership Network is very important to UTMB, and it's very important to me personally also. I originally was scheduled to be out of town today, but now I'm able to attend and, and am thrilled to be here to hear from this distinguished group. So let me just provide a few introductions, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Raymer for the panel to proceed with its presentation and discussion. I think um, the panelists really need no introduction, nor does the moderator, but let me just say a few words about them and talk about their roles today at UTMB. I'll start with Dr. Raymer, who will serve as the moderator of the discussion. He is Senior Vice President in the Office of Health Policy and Legislative Affairs. And over the past three decades, Dr. Raymer has held numerous academic and administrative positions here. He is a tenured professor in the Department of Pediatrics, the Department of Family Medicine, and the Department of Preventive Medicine and Community Health. So he wears many hats and has much influence across our university. He was appointed to his current position in 2008. In 2016, uh, he was also asked to assume the role as executive director of our Community and Global Health Collaborating Center. Um, Ann O'Connell has served as Vice President for Ambulatory Operations of the University of Texas Medical Branch Health System, where she oversees all operations for over 90 clinics, both on Galveston Island and the mainland. Under her leadership, our clinics have grown patient volume by 40% by opening 18 new practices, three practice acquisitions, transitioned 13 regional maternal child health practices, and opened four new urgent care clinics. And when do you sleep? <laughs> so and anyway, in this particular fiscal year, I believe that our outpatient clinic visits will exceed 1.1 million. So Anne, thank you for participating today. Thank you. Becky Karenik is our Senior Vice President for Strategic and Business Planning, a position to which she was promoted in 2018. In this role, she directs our institution's business development efforts and works collaborative, uh, collaboratively with leaders from our health system and the faculty group practice to define new business opportunities, develop strategic partnerships, expand programs in current and new markets, and ensure that our institution is well positioned to thrive in an increasingly competitive healthcare environment. So Becky, thank you for joining us today. Dr. Norma Perez is Associate Professor of Internal Medicine Geriatrics. That's sensitive to a number of us. We appreciate her service in geriatrics <laughs> and preventative medicine and community health. Her service also includes Director, Medical School of Advising Program, and, and special projects including the Hispanic Center of Excellence in Frontera de Salud. Dr. Perez, thank you very much for being a part of our discussion today. Uh, finally, Dr. Deborah Jones is our Senior Vice President and Dean of the School of Nursing. She is also the Rebecca Seeley Distinguished Centennial Chair. Prior to arriving at UTMB, Dr. Jones held a number of administrative and leadership roles in academic health care uh, in terms of um, being involved with facilities, professional organizations, academic programs, and a number of other interests that are important to all of us as healthcare professionals or those who support the work of academic medical centers. She um, came to us from the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston School of Nursing. We're very happy to have her here at UTMB. So again, thank you to all of our panelists. Dr. Raymer, please proceed. Dr. Callender, thank you uh, and your office for sponsoring uh, this event today. Uh, I look out and see so many people uh, that I know are excited about the panelists that we have and their opportunity to share. Uh, the four individuals before you are people well known to most of you. Uh, many of you will uh, look at them as mentors, as examples of who you would like to become. Uh, last year's uh, meeting like this was uh, extraordinary one for growth, and I'm just grateful for each uh, individual who is here today. We've had a good uh, pre-meeting and a good opportunity to share stories, so we'll not bore you with those. We're going to jump right into mm -hmm. some questions, and I'm going to start with uh, Dean Jones, of course, 
and uh, because she's right at my left hand. Uh, and uh, I'm going to ask uh, you, Deborah, what is the one thing that really turned your career? So, you know, one thing that turned my career, I don't think that I would say my career has turned. Um, I'm one of those people, as many in healthcare would say, that knew that they wanted to go in healthcare. Particularly, I knew I wanted to be a nurse. So, always knew that, I'm still a nurse, so my career as a nurse continues to move forward and will never change. What I do think, though, is I take these exits. Exits off that highway, <laughs> career path, right? So, exit to different avenues, get off there, learn a little bit, do a little bit, and get right back on the highway and stand as a nurse. Um, and the ability to do that, or why I have done that, is because of really jumping into opportunities. You know, stepping into those opportunities that may not feel comfortable at the moment, but just having the courage to step out, um, to take those, being comfortable with uncertainty of where the event may lead me, um, and having some really great mentors along the way who have identified things in me that maybe I didn't identify in myself, and then saying, okay, you know, I can do this, and stepping out to try to do it. So. I think that's, that's what I would say. Wonderful. I, I like that exit ramp and own ramp that you developed. <laughs> I think all of us need to be uh, using that. Norma, how about you? Well, um, unlike Dr. Jones, my exits have been true exits <laughs> uh, because of personal life circumstances. But I've always stayed within the realm of health. Um, not unhappy about the choices that I've made, because I am, because of those choices, I'm here, and am able to jointly commit to UTMB and be loyal to it. Um, but my 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 path has been different. Um, I've completely left clinic. Then I went into research. Completely left that, and now academic medicine. That's where I'm really happy with uh, right now, and that's where you have me. And you seem to be very comfortable along the way with those decisions, was, was that just your own personal comfort or did you have people offering you advice along that way? I always, always listen to my mom and she's always been an advocate for uh, having mentors. So I've always had mentors along the path, my, my career. And um, even those that are not around me, I go and seek one. And I've always had people talk to me, okay, well, these are your choices if you want to make this decision, this decision to leave this. Well, you know, and you want to stay within the health area, you can do this and do that. And then I just make my own choices. But um, obviously it was a lot of inner, inner thinking and inner being pensive for a long time, many years. And so I, uh, I was happy with uh, the decisions. But yes, yes always wonderful. with the support of mentors. Okay, Becky, I'm looking at you. Um, I think I would uh, not focus on one specific turning point, um, but more instead of looking at it as the exit ramp, I kind of chose more it was the entrance ramp. And what was the opportunity um, to uh, consider and looking at um, opportunities as they presented themselves more to be results oriented? What could I do and how could I accomplish whatever it was before me, understanding that I didn't know? Oftentimes it was, um, what was that opportunity? So I chose that more as the entrance ramp, um, learn what it was as I went along, and then um, demonstrating results tended to be what helped to turn me into um, a specific career orientation. And we're down. <laughs> We're down to you, Anne, and one of the things that Anne uh, said that struck me right after she came here, we were talking about all the community clinics, and Anne said, that's what makes my heart sing. I don't know whether you even that's remember right. that, but I absolutely do. the joy she gets from work every day. So tell me what really turned your career into what you're doing now. Thank you. Um, I, like Deborah, knew that I wanted to be a nurse from like the age of five. And so that path in my early years was very clear to me and very straight. Um, in 1994, when my children were two and five and 
Um, my husband was working a full-time job and I was working a full-time job. I became a little bit disillusioned with where my career was going. Um, I felt like I was working very hard, but not getting anywhere. And I lost my passion, temporarily. So I took a, I, I exited the ramp and I took a job with, a, with an outplacement firm. And I did uh, outpatient, or excuse me, outpatient, see how much I love it? <laughs> out, outplacement training. And so uh, this was way outside the realm of nursing or anything that I had ever done. I also, on the side, opened up my own business. Uh, it took me a while. I struggled to make money to support my family. But um, the thrill of it was that I received training about um, going into companies like Nike and Intel and working with groups of people who had lost their jobs. And I was the first person they met with after they were informed that they lost their job. And it was my job over a two-day period to move them from point A to point B, from being angry um, to beginning to realize that they had transferable skills and this is no fault of their own, and putting them back together, reading hundreds of resumes and doing hundreds of mock interviews, that job gave me more confidence in myself than ever. So when I re-entered healthcare, I was a completely different person, a completely different leader. Wow, that's a transformative story. Thank you. It really is. Well, we know that we often hear to say we're here because we stand on the shoulders of giants who were there before us. All of us learn in our career from people we've worked with. I'd be interested, and I think the folks in our audience would really want to know, how were you mentored into uh, going toward a higher leadership position? Who or what ways uh, did people speak to you? Becky, can we start with you on that? Sure. So as I thought about this question a little bit, um, and thinking about some great bosses that I've had over the years and some wonderful mentors, the one thing that really stood out for me, I don't know that I had um, very specific direct mentorship where I could say, this is the one person who has done these things and really helped me. It was more, as I started thinking about it, what have I learned from a number of different people over the years, and how did I personally engage with those individuals to be mentored by them? And so, very specifically, it, um, one person that I thought of and thought about um, very uh, pointedly, um, a conversation one day, it was a conversation he was having with his leadership team. And I've hung on to that conversation over the years, and the discussion was about change. And the discussion was about healthcare, and if we don't learn to be comfortable with the changing environment, people won't be successful. So that was the message that he was giving to his leadership team. I really took that as, well, that was my personal mentoring message over the years as I've continued to reflect on that conversation. But again, a number of different people that I've had the privilege of working for and working with. So oftentimes I've thought of the mentor not necessarily as the person that I've worked for, but as the person I work alongside of. So again, as I think about um, what has been the most important thing, it's really been around the change and the need to embrace change and how to do that, and watching people throughout my career who've done that well. Thank you. Anne. Yes, um, I, I, like Becky, have had many, many mentors and excellent bosses, excellent coaches. Um, I've also had a boss or two I've learned from in terms of who I don't want to be, and um, that too is a lesson. And, but uh, there was a particular physician in my career, and you know, your mentors don't always come from your exact discipline. And that was a, a great lesson for me. Someone who really believed in me and would always tap me for new assignments and new opportunities and uh, promotions, interim jobs that I would have never even thought I was qualified for. He came to me one day and said, what do you know about federally qualified health centers? This was 2002. And I said, I know absolutely nothing. 
And he said, how would you like to learn with me? And so over the next two years, um, I wrote a successful 200-page wow. grant, my first one. I did not know how to write a grant. I went to a class on how to write a grant. Um, <laughs> and we opened a very successful FQHC in an underserved part of Portland, Oregon, and incorporated mental health services and wow. a pharmacy. And that was, that was a wonderful experience, and I absolutely had no idea what I was doing. Um, but we walked through it together one step at a time, and um, I, I, I love him for that. He used to always say to me, he would always have the, these Gandhi quotes. He was all about Gandhi. Um, <laughs> and he'd always say to me, and always be truthful, right? Always be gentle, but be fearless, right? <laughs> be fearless and go for it. So he taught me that. A good word of wisdom for all of us, I think, yes. Deborah. Yes. So um, I, too, have had and continue to have many mentors in my life. Um, I can think of informal and formal mentors. And I didn't realize, though, probably until about 18 years ago, the value of mentorship. And that was my first formal mentor. She, I had just finished my master's degree and took a role under her as a clinical research project supervisor in an academic um, center, and I can remember in the interview her saying to me, so you plan to go back, not asking, so you plan to go back for your doctorate? And me, very um, the honest person that I am, said, no. <laughs> no. And I still got the job, right? But two years later, I was in a doctoral program, and so she mentored me in the role, but she also mentored me in life um, and continues to be my mentor to this day. And one of the quotes that she used to say to me and that I say to people now is, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I've had formal mentors along the way, too, in different roles. I think as we evolve, we grow, we move into different positions. We, you may need to change your mentor, and it's okay. So she mentors me in one aspect of life. I've had formal mentor, informal mentors, even one at my... Um, uh, last work area that saw some things in me that I didn't know was there. You know her very well. And uh, she would say to me that, she would ask me to take on positions that everyone else, including myself, was thinking, are you sure? Me? That role? Um, and she saw something and it was right and fostered something in me there. And then I've done formal mentorship programs under uh, different, uh, you know, American Association of Colleges of Nursing. So programs that have been formal in terms of mentorship. So I think it's important I, executive coaches are important. I think it's important to have yeah. someone who will help you and develop and give you that real feedback that you need that may not always be positive, but it's constructive, and it helps you to grow, and it helps you to learn. So um, mentorship is, is something that is near and dear to my heart. And Norma, you were sharing uh, this week that you have embarked on uh, uh, mentorship experiences and how productive they are. Could you share with our audience some of your uh, the occasions that you found mentoring helpful? Yes, um, <clears throat> throughout my career and my lifetime, um, I've been, um, I've run into situations where people actually believe that I can do something. <laughs> <laughs> so, with that, year after year you grow older and then you go through your life changes and life, your career, uh, you actually start believing it. And uh, so um, I look for um, leadership opportunities, mentorship opportunities. Um, I just uh, recently, um, about two years ago, I changed. I, I didn't change. I added a mentor to my, two mentors into my, uh, to my list. And, and thanks to that, I've been able to grow two times more faster in, in where I'm at now. Um, but I, I um, it, it's come not because it was something natural. It was because someone, there's always been someone at, at the workplace or at home or at church or at where places where I was involved in um, that they believed that I could do something. And so I felt that it was my responsibility to go and seek help um, uh, to, to be a better person and be able to provide, you know, what people expect of me. 
Um, and just recently, my new my new immediate supervisor, she um, I appreciate her because she actually believes in me as well, and she asked me to apply to uh, a leadership program for mid career uh, uh, faculty, and I was accepted. It was a very competitive application with the AAMC the lead program, so I'm really excited about that. And so I really am appreciative of, of my environment now, and I. I, I, sometimes I believe that it's it's our duty or our responsibility to go and seek um, those people that you feel you'd like to be become or, or at, at least you know pick up some really good stuff from, and it's our responsibility to go and look for those. I think it's uh, very important. Maybe we pause for a second and just make an observation. You've just heard from four people who most of you and and myself included, would look at the very top in leadership. And what did you hear from all four of them? They're still engaged in mentorship relationships. They are continuing to grow. Is that a fair observation? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. So that must be important. If you're taking notes, put a star by that. That <laughs> growth continues, okay? Now, we... We're creatures of habit, right? How many times have uh, you been told that we're creatures of habit? Therefore, there must be good habits and bad habits and this habit and that. So what sort of habits do people who are successful have? And I'm going to start with Deborah. <laughs> uh, some of the habits of a habit. I, I, I think I classify these as habits because you have to well, I have to pay attention to it, is to be present. To be present. Not just be there, but be there, right? And, um, and folks to feel that and know that you are engaged and you are um, paying attention. And then to listen. And I think that goes hand in hand with being present. Um, listening and being open to um, what you hear. Um, and I think with listening, for me, it is not just being able to repeat back, yeah, I heard you say this to me, but rather it is that you see that some, maybe I've changed the course because of something that you said to me, or maybe I didn't change the course because of something that you said to me. So um, that, and then I have to have within my life, I've, I've tried to build in some time that is me time, downtime, some time to really just kind of, you know, let go and um, turn everything off. And I would tell you my guilty pleasure, but I don't think, I, I don't think I'm going to tell you guys that. <laughs> Let's talk afterwards. But, um, you know, to, something, though, that allows you to really just turn off so then you can come back refreshed and be ready. I have to have some moment of that every week, whether it's four hours during the week, whether it's a full day during the week, something. So to be able to just kind of come back and be replenished and, and ready to go. And then one last thing is to um, positive, positivity. You know, life is challenging, and there is no um, doubts about it. Our work is challenging. In everything that we have, we face challenges all the time. But I try to face them with a positive attitude and try to put things in perspective because it could be so much worse. I could be one of those patients that you're caring for today, right now. You know, I could not be able to be here at all. I could not have, you know, the mental capacity. So I try to think of those things to always have a positive attitude and to use that with everything that I uh, and you say that with such conviction that I have to believe that for you, that's a choice. It's a choice. You choose it's to be choice. positive. It's a choice. It, it, for me, it's a choice because there are things that easily could get me down. And my day, I could reflect on you that I'm having a bad day, but you didn't do that. To, you didn't do that. So that's not fair. Right? So it is a choice. Yeah. yeah. Good point. Anne, how about you? What sort of habits have you developed that sustain your career? Many years ago, um, one of my mentors taught me that as you come to work every day as a leader, that there is a coat that you wear. So I mentally imagine myself when I get to work, I put on the coat of being a leader. And that makes me completely different than I was at home last night watching TV, right? You can't just say everything you want to say. You can't let it rip. Um, <laughs> my husband's in the audience. He'll tell you. Sometimes at home, I just let it rip. But, um, <laughs> um, but you put on that very important 
role and you have to be different. You cannot be the person that you are at home. Um, the other thing that I do is I carry with me at all times the goals of the organization and what the strategic plan is, what my boss, Donna Sollenberger, has asked me to do in the coming months, and I carry that with me everywhere I go in every meeting. And if the meeting, if there's a lull, I'll flip to it and take a look at it, making sure that part of my day is spent on the things that really matter, because we can get so consumed in the day-to-day, -day, putting out fires, HR problems, a telephone call about a facility issue, that by the end of the day you realize, wow, what did I do that the organization needed me to do, right? So um, that, has really, that has really helped. I think the other thing that a habit that I have um, is I read a lot. Um, Maybe I don't read the right things, um, <laughs> but, I, but, but I read a lot, and I'm, and I'm curious, and I ask a lot of questions at work. I, I also believe in my team, and I defend them to the bitter end, and um, I trust them, and I think in doing that over and over, they in turn trust me. Very good. Becky, what are those habits that you've perfected all these years? I'm sure I've perfected a number of bad habits. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I think about um, what, what drives me, what um, makes me who I am, and try to do what needs to be done every day, uh, the positivity to me is absolutely just paramount. We all have a lot to do. How we approach what we do is our choice. Um, the priorities change every day. They change sometimes within the hour a few different times. And so um, embracing it positively is critical. The other thing that I work hard to do, um, I'm still learning to do it in a better way, but establishing relationships. It's a relationship-oriented business. We are dealing with people all day long. And so what are those relationships that we have across the organization? What are the relationships that we have um, outside of the organization? But, those are critical to our own individual success and more importantly to the criticality of how successful the organization is. It's all relational and it's really important to remember that. But it's a habit, you have to work at it every single day. The, the other piece that's really important to me um, from a developing a habit and using it continuously, it was very hard when I first started doing this, um, but direct communication. We all want to be talked to directly. We want direct feedback. But if you're going to give direct feedback, you have to be willing and understanding how to take direct communication and direct feedback. So I'd offer that as um, it's, it's a habit I've tried to work on in terms of, um, again, being present, but being confident and being able to um, speak directly. People don't always like to talk about what's not pleasant. Um, talking about the elephant in the room is often very difficult, but there is a respectful way to do it, and there's a way to do it that will ultimately bring people together. Um, but again, it's, it's a habit that I've had to work at, and you don't, you don't develop good habits um, unless you practice them, and so that's what I would offer. your habits that uh, you're most proud of or find the most useful? So when I was uh, very young, and this is at elementary, my mother always told us the Benito Juarez, first Mexi uh, the first president of Mexico, um, he had a, a, a saying, el respeto al derecho ajeno es la paz. So respect towards others is, um, brings peace or it's um, the way to go. So my ultimate pretty much on the top of the list is always respect others. Um, and so I, I work towards that to respect others' choices, decisions, and that's pretty much how I, I work. Um, and then hopefully build my, uh, my employees' trust. Um, I'm, this is a relationship. Um, it's all based on relationships um, and direct communication and uh, is very important but I think that I work really hard to keep the habit, uh, to, I work really hard to accept change. 
and I know it's changes pretty hard for a lot of people, um, but I I um, I try to embrace it with 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 happiness, with you know with a goal that it will bring something better. Um, so that is respect, trust, and communication and change, open to change. Very good. We've we've had a word that uh, you brought up. Uh, and that is being present. I think perhaps we should spend a little more time uh, talking about that. Uh, sometimes people don't understand what being present means. Uh, and sometimes the definition is helped by defining it in ways you are not present. So what prevents you in your daily uh, path with people? What prevents you or stands in the way? What's the obstacles? Uh, that you face for being fully present in your work. Becky, can I start with you today? I don't know about the rest of you, but there's a lot to do. And trying to decide what's most important and managing a conversation and the moment in which you're sitting and trying not to think about everything else that you're supposed to be doing. Um, managing the priorities, knowing which one should be at the top of the list that day or that hour. Um, remembering that something may have changed 30 minutes before that. So keeping up with all of those things, those th that whole process, um, that keeps me from being present in the moment, and I have to work at it. I have to sometimes write on a piece of paper what it is I'm there to talk about to make sure that I try hard not to deviate from that, from a, from a where does my mind wander. Um, it, it's, it's very easy to go back to what seems to be more important right that minute than where you're sitting, but in the end, people have given you their time, um, you're providing your time, and you need to make the most of it. So it's very important. Um, plus, people don't trust you if you're not present with them in the room. Um, it's part of building trust with people. Anne, how about uh, from your viewpoint, being mm -hmm. present? I agree with a lot of what Becky said. It is a very busy time at UTMB, and um, there can be competing priorities and I'm constantly arguing with myself about what is the top priority. Um, I do um, a lot of list making and then prioritizing it and making sure that I've got the right thing at the top of my mind but I'm also knocked off my focus by you know and a lot of us women do suffer from this, we're thinking while we're at work, we're thinking about our families, we're thinking about our aging parents, we're thinking about whether or not we have something to cook for dinner, and who's going to pick up the dog food on the way home. And, and all of those thoughts come rushing in and take over your attention units. So for me, I have, I have to really struggle to compartmentalize okay, you're at work, you need to be at work. When you're at home, you need to be at home. I still struggle with this. It's, it's not, you know, it's not something I've achieved by any stretch. Um, but I think that um, focusing on um, the priorities is probably one of my biggest, biggest challenges because there's more than one. And Deborah, since you brought up that word, <laughs> you get to tell us what blocks your ability to be present. Uh, yes. I agree with both of Anne and Becky. And I would say also it would be um, a lack of self-awareness at the moment, hmm. right, or during that day. So if I, I, I need to be aware of what is happening, there are things that are happening behind the scenes, and how is it affecting me today? So do I come in in that morning or I have a, a, a day that's packed with meetings, but something, a crisis just happened at home the night before. So what can I do to really be able to, I do try to compartmentalize, to be able, be able to deal with, you know, that situation so that it does not take the center of my attention when I'm sitting in front of you or speaking to you. So I think it is just being aware of how you're feeling, being aware of what you're feeling when you're going into that meeting, being aware of what you're feeling when you're up on this panel stage right now, and, um, and then deal with it in some way. I have to, when I have 
if there are lots of deadlines that are coming up and I have, you know, uh, things that are um, thrown at me that I need to deal with that are outside of those deadlines, I've got to put everything in a space or in a block or a piece on the calendar. And even if it's my written calendar that Dr. Raymer gives us now, that health policy one, <laughs> that I have it in a place and it's off my mind for a minute because I know it has a place. I know I'm going to see it at that point, And that helps to bring down that level and um, helps me to be more present. So. Good. So those are habits that anyone could adapt, right? Yes, I think so. So I'm, I'm the guy who has cards in my pocket. <laughs> and if I can write it on a card, uh, for some reason, it's stored for later. Right. And it, I can take it out of my mind. Norma, how about you? What have you used successfully? I have an electronic filing card here. It's just a bit in my mind. <laughs> um, I have a really good uh, photographic memory. Um, so if I don't, if I don't... It, if I don't necessarily have to write it down, but I remember, and my staff sometimes wonder, is she crazy or something? <laughs> so how did she remember? That was two weeks ago. Um, so now, because it's so much, so many priorities, um, now I have to start writing them down, but I still have some in, in my brain. Um, and I just, I've learned to compartmentalize. I really do, I believe in it. I believe that you do have to, this is personal, and right now I'm at work and this is business. And, um, and even in meetings, when you know that you have this stress uh, from home, lingering there, you know, you're carrying with throughout the day, um, you, it's, it's, a, it's a practice, you have to practice to compartmentalize and just not completely erase it because it's still there um, in your brain or in your mind, uh, but focus on the on the target. I, I'm sure in your positions uh, you have many students and employees approach you and inquire how did you get where you are? Because I want to be just like you, Ann. I want to have that path and I want to be a leader like you. Uh, I, I know I've been approached by students that asked me, how do, how do you do your job? How did you train to do that? And sometimes it's a complex answer. Uh, what do you think about the statement that uh, there's a straight path that you follow to your dream job? Uh, maybe you could describe that to us by how did you get the position you're in now and was that a straight path? And could we start with you, Deborah? Okay, yeah, we can. <laughs> it was not a straight path, let's just say that. Um, and if asked that question of how I got here, I followed my passion. I said yes to opportunities. I prepared for those opportunities by reading, being mentored, being open, continuing to grow and learn. And... And Dr. Callender said yes. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was not a straight path. Really, it wasn't. And it was, it was some of those things. Um, you know, and I, like Norma, I left academia for a stint and went into the healthcare side of things because I thought that was where I wanted to be, you know, after I finished my doctoral program, which was a good thing that I did that, though, because it let me know where I wanted to be and that I wasn't being fulfilled in it. And, um, and I think because I, I like to read and I like to learn, et cetera, it just kind of helped me to continue to grow and be ready for the position um, to be in this role. Does that answer? It does. Okay. With lots of room to spare. <laughs> Norma, how about you? Um, I think uh, uh, the same. Um, I think that um, I've, I work a lot under a lot of with passion. If I'm not passionate about something, believe me, I won't be here, or I won't embark that project, or I wouldn't, I won't accept. Um, if I'm passionate about it, I believe in the mission, I believe in the goal, I'm there. I don't question anything, and then I just dive like I literally dive into the pool without wondering if I know how to swim or not. Um, and so when I uh, was in Houston and I was recruited from here to come and work with Dr. Goodwin. And then from Dr. Goodwin's office, I was recruited from Dr. Laurie Thomas's office to come into the office 
Office of Student Affairs and Admissions, I, I saw the opportunity and I didn't, I didn't hesitate to say yes um, because I knew it was with students and I already had started working a little bit with students and I just felt very, very in love with working with students and I said, I can, I can do this. And, um, and I just took the opportunity. I took the opportunity, I didn't say, I didn't hesitate to say, you know, well, what do I need to know or anything? No, I just said, yes, I will do it. And from there, it's been, this year it's gonna be 10 years and I'm really happy. I'm still in love with it since from day one. Great, great story. Becky. Oh, I don't think it's a straight path at all. I think um, it's, um, it's a windy road. But I think also, as uh, several years ago, I set my sights on working in a healthcare organization. And I decided that when I was in college. And I wasn't sure what I was going to do because I wasn't going to be a nurse and I wasn't going to be a doctor. So I had to figure <laughs> out what were the other opportunities. <laughs> but I knew I wanted to work in healthcare. So again, as I thought about um, what does that look like, it took me a little bit of time to figure out what's the opportunity in healthcare that's not a clinician. Um, but I did figure it out, and I figured out pretty quickly. I had a passion around business development and um, growth and strategy. And so over the years, I've looked for those opportunities. Um, that might not have been the title of my job. It might have been a little bitty piece of my job. But what could I do along the way um, for whatever job I had to continue to develop those skills and develop those opportunities? And so um, as I had came to UTMB almost 10 years ago now as a consultant, um, being at UTMB, there was just a certain amount of energy. It was a family, and the opportunity here was significant. And there was more that I thought I could do at UTMB as a UTMB employee than as a consultant. I've had a consulting practice for about 12 years. And so that's actually how I made my way to UTMB. And then as I've been here over the last 10 years, um, really looking at what are the opportunities to further develop and grow this organization. So while I was a managed care person and I did that for years, most people don't necessarily understand that's a business development function in many, many ways. And so again, continued progression, but really all about, again, I think you said passion. Um, what's my passion and what am I interested in and what can I bring my skills to do to benefit the organization? So I think that's really how I ended up in the spot that I am today. Ann, uh -huh. how about you? Um, I, I think that I was, I was always able to take advantage of the opportunities along the way. Um, and lots and lots of people are responsible for that. Um, some people would tap me and say, I think you would be ideal for this. And I'd say, no, I'm not. But I would try it anyway. Um, I, so I learned a lot doing that. I also searched in my career for things that, where I can be of service. And I know that might sound trite to some of you, but I grew up with a father who taught me to always be of service to others. Patients, faculty, staff, the people that work in our clinics. Um, there's nothing that I enjoy more than sitting with staff and talking to them about their work and their workflow and knowing at the end of the day that I can somehow make a difference. Uh, it might be as something as simple as, how come you get up from your front desk location and go all the way to the back of the clinic to pick something up off the printer? Maybe we should buy you a printer for the front desk. Sometimes it's just really simple things that you can do in a job that makes you be successful, right? It's the simple things to me, it's the small things. Um, so I also, the way I ended up in, um, in Texas was, a. will tell a quick story. Mm -hmm. I got a call from a recruiter and my husband and I had been in Portland for too many years. We needed a change and so I applied for the job and interviewed and like within three months I was here. My friend said, you're crazy. Galveston, Texas is the exact opposite of Portland, Oregon. What are you, what are you doing? <laughs> but I think that it's that insight of knowing you need a change, knowing you need a profound change in your life. And my husband and my daughter 
my cat and my dog survived the whole thing. And we're very happy here. And I, I love this organization, and I love the work that I do. So it was a good change. Sometimes you've just got to realize when you've got to make a change, right? Yeah. Also, audience, you have heard one word used by all of these people. And this is guess my mind a question. It's not specific. But would you believe that a new opportunity is a threat to any of these individuals? No. Every one of them in their path to where they are welcomed new opportunities. They welcomed that challenge. They welcomed doing something they had never done before. So I think that is also something we just have to pause and say, uh, that's courageous. It's smart. It's a tactical decision. And what you proved to yourself that you're capable beyond the limits that people may have placed upon you. That's why perhaps you're where you are. And everybody wants to be you. So just my observation. I have to be a little clinical occasionally. <laughs> uh, so we're uh, going to uh, one of our final questions here. And uh, this one is uh, probably a more difficult question to answer. Uh, so with that in mind, I'm going to start with Norma. Uh, <laughs> I just knew it. <laughs> what do you do when you witness disrespect or heavy-handedness towards a colleague, be it male or female? What do you do when you see someone not treating someone else as this organization would want them treated? The first thing I do is support. I approach the individual, and I always offer my support. Um, and you know, it happens. It, it, we're not exempt to seeing things like this. Um, I personally don't think that UTMB is a workplace that um, fosters that or sees it on a daily basis, but you can probably, um, you know, we're not exempt for it, from it. But I definitely do support, uh, provide support, um, offer my support, and, um, and approach the individual. I don't leave them alone. I won't leave them or just say, oh, poor guy or poor girl, and just take off. No, I would actually approach them and provide um, support. Okay. Deborah. <laughs> um, so I think... Uh one of two things I would do, and it would depend on the situation. So there would be the time where in the moment, you may need to call for a pause in the moment. If it is that such of disrespect that, you know, it is disruptive and, you know, you, can, you know when there are times to really call for that pause. Now let's take a pause. Let's see, where, you know, what is the goal of this meeting, this agenda, and let's kind of regroup. And then there are the moments when you don't do that, right? But then afterwards, you, you have to provide, I would have to provide some type of feedback to the person who was disrespectful and the per, some support to the person who was on the receiving hand of it and um, help them work that through. And I know many of us may think, and including myself, well, is this really my place to say anything? Do I provide feedback? Is that not? I, mean, I think it's all of our place to do that. Um, I have not, just as Norma said, you know, had to deal with that here, thank goodness. And, um, but it, it could happen at any time, and it's all of our jobs to step up and prevent it and to create a space where it doesn't happen, to continue to create the environment that allows people to have healthy discourse. And we, it may or may not, we may or may not agree with each other, but that's okay. That's what make things, makes things better, but we can do that in a respectful way at all times. So I think creating the environment that... Um, allows that. So creating that environment, Deborah, would you say that's a major attribute of a leader? Absolutely. Okay. Culture, I think the culture starts from above. I mean, yeah, yep. I, I definitely think it does. So, yes. Okay. And how about you? I'm, I'm, I'm sure everything is just absolutely beautiful in the clinics and mm -hmm. there's no controversy <laughs> there no at problems. all. <laughs> there are no problems. You call out there and you will not find any problems. <laughs> um, I think um, when I see a colleague being disrespected in a meeting, you know, it breaks my heart, and it does happen. Um, I usually try to 
redirect. Sometimes I will say, pardon me. <laughs> um, you try to be as gentle as you can. And then if I see people talking over others, you know, see someone dominating a meeting or coming on too strong, or as you said, being heavy handed, I will try to bring my colleague out in the discussion by saying something like, Becky is a real expert in this area. I'd like to hear what Becky has to say. Or, Norma, you haven't had anything to say over the last few minutes because this person's been taken up all the time. No. <laughs> <laughs> Norma, you haven't had a chance to speak in the meeting. I'm sure you have thoughts on the subject. So you create a window, right, for that person to come out. And then if I have enough of a relationship built with the person who was the offender at the end of the meeting, um, I will go later uh, behind closed doors and say, hey, what was that about? Did you realize you just talked over that person? You just ran her right over. Um, and sometimes that's well received and sometimes that's not, but it's still important to call it out. So you're underscoring professionalism in the workplace when you do that. What do you think your employees think of you when you do that? I think they feel that I am truly listening and on their side and believe in them and that I'm fully aware of what's going on in the room and the power imbalances that can occur in our clinics and our meetings across our whole campus. And um, I think that people want, regardless of rank and regardless of title, people want to be treated as our colleagues and our peers more than anything in the world. And so I think in that moment, they feel like my colleague. Good. Becky, what do you think? You do some hard negotiating. And uh, <laughs> I bet you've never seen heavy handed people in the absolutely managed care not. arena. No, absolutely not. Um, <laughs> you know, I think sometimes we struggle with what's the difference in a disagreement that people are having in a room versus um, inappropriate um, discourse in terms of people being belittled or not being um, treated appropriately. So I do think there's a fine line in terms of understanding what's happening in the room. I think a disagreement is healthy, but it has got to be a respectful discussion and people's ideas have to be heard. And sometimes, as Ann said, it's as simple as calling out the person. Um, oftentimes, if you know them, you know they're thinking something and um, it, they need to be asked. We need to ask for their opinion. We need to ask what they're thinking. Um, maybe it's what concerns you. But the very specific issue of disrespectful behavior and condescending behavior, um, I have, I, I don't think it's a problem in this organization by any means, but occasionally it happens. And when it does, um, certainly as Norma said, you support the one who was offended, but you've got to go behind closed doors to the person who was the offender and have a conversation with them. You know, maybe they had a bad day. Maybe they had a, something that caused them to be on edge and we don't know what that is. And so just helping them understand how they came across is often all that needs to happen. Um, but it's our responsibility as leaders to make sure that we've created the right environment for people um, to participate. So I do feel strongly about the issue. Well, uh, Becky created the perfect segue here for us also, uh, saying that uh, there, everybody has questions. It's time for our audience to have questions. Uh, so you'll see mics uh, in strategic places. If you would find your way to a mic, if you have a question, this is your uh, fair opportunity to ask uh, your experts up here. Uh, anything's fair game, I think. Each of, of you uh, have a particular leadership style or you adapt your leadership style to different situations? You want to start, in Leadership style. So do each of you have uh, your own leadership style or is a one style that works best? So for me, there is not one style that works best. Um, I've had to learn the hard way to become a situational leader. Um, certain situations call on you to be tough. A lot of Becky's work calls on her to make some tough calls and and 
Some situations call on you to be gentle and kind and listen a lot.、Um, I think that sometimes it's really important to step out and absolutely lead during times of chaos.、Um, and so, I think as a really good leader, you have to hone many skills so that when you're in a situation, you know what style is going to get the right outcome. Becky, how about you? Truly situational.、Um, but again, I think it's also important as a leader to understand what I know people often overuse、uh, emotional intelligence and your own EQ. But you need to know how you present in a room. You need to know what your leadership style is.、Um, seeking input from others has been helpful for me over the years. What do I do well? What do I not do well?、Um, did this approach work? Did it not work? What could I have done differently? But、um, yes, situational, but also understanding. Um, how you come across to other people is very important in terms of how effective you are as a leader among other folks.、Uh, a plug here for HR. If you、uh, are interested in sharpening your leadership skills,、uh, there's certainly an opportunity、uh, to consult with HR and look at the EQ、uh, Uh, assessment that's there, the 360, and a number of other things that are extremely important to discovering where your attributes lie and where the areas that you can stand some additional training, coaching, or opportunity. And、uh, there are some people back here. Would you hold up your hands from HR? Ian, you too.、Uh, see any of those folks afterwards and、uh, schedule an appointment. Be helpful. Do you have anything you would like to add?、Uh, has a question. Norma at all? In regards to leadership style? Yeah.、Uh, definitely situational.、Uh, I agree with Becky and Anna.、Um, that's situational.、Uh, that's where I think that、um, when you're in the situation where、um, you, you,、um, you are there as a leader, all the skills that you didn't, ha- didn't know you had, they just come out and flourish. Uh, but it definitely has to be situational to be non biased. Deborah, situational? Yeah, I have to say that. <laughs> I, naturally, I would lean towards years ago to transformational, which you know, really involves and it's a give and take, but situational is actually how I have to function because, yeah, it, it calls for different、um, actions at different times.、So. All right.、Um, yes, ma'am, your question. I want to thank you all for.、Um, Providing your、uh, insight and leadership.、Uh, actually, I have two questions. One is talk a little bit about the importance of being a good follower、uh, in becoming a leader. And secondly, how important is it to surround yourself with good teams in order to achieve uh, these uh, milestones? I'll start with you. Sure. Yeah, great. Thank you,、um, Dr. Sullivan. Those are excellent points and keys. You cannot be a good leader if you're not a, follow, a good follower. You, you cannot, because you have to be open to listening to and leading from the place of those who you are,、um, who are reporting to you, right? So, I mean, I could come in and completely, it's my way and this is the way, and I'm leading you down this path and this is the vision. But guess what? They would not follow. Unless I was able to follow by listening to what is needed from this organization and then making those adjustments accordingly.、Um, and then your second point was about、uh, I just lost my train of thought. The following were and teams. 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 Oh, what what、yeah. role teams yeah, have? Yeah. So again,、um, any good leader has a great team. You cannot、uh, do anything without a great team because you don't know every, everything. And in order for、uh, you to be able to move things along, the team h a v e to be, help support you. You know, everybody brings something to the table. The leader is not the one that takes, the leader in terms of position <coughs> or title is not the one that moves the organization along. It is the team of folks that moves the organization along. And I think you lead from every seat that you're in, and you have to surround yourself with great people. Otherwise, you know, you'll fail. If you ever read the book, it wasn't on the screen, good to great. You'll understand. I mean, you just cannot do it without a, a great team of people、um, to help move things forward.、So. Any comments for the others on our, our panel? 
I, I believe that, um, that you aren't a leader. You're not identified as a leader if you don't have followers. So, it, it, and you follow also people that are prosperous, disciplined, uh, courageous, organized, um, positive. Those are the teams that I want and the teams that I want to look for, people that I want to look for to be part of my team. And then, so we all follow each other and then a leader comes, emerges. By the way, when you're putting teams together, I think HR can help you with that too. <laughs> uh, is is that not that? right? <laughs> you know, actually there are characteristics that make that team. And uh, HR is another place, if you've been given an assignment, you can go and they can help you feel, fill uh, those positions with people that you need. So HR is getting a double hit today, so they're going to actually have an pos open position for a new receptionist to field your calls. <laughs> right, Ian? Yeah. Are there any other questions from our audience? If not, I'm going to impromptu ask, uh, ask Deborah here to say something about the Women's Leadership Network at UTMB. Uh, and I'll give the others of you opportunity to. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about the Women's Resource Group, and um, Anne will talk yeah. about the Women's Leadership Network. Okay. So there is a new group, <laughs> the Women's Resource Group, which is under, actually, Human Resources has supported uh, uh, this new group to form in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. And the mission of the Women's Resource Group, which is different than the Women's Leadership, is really to be an inclusive, open to anyone, no matter, matter role, title, et cetera, here at UTMB, to help support personal and professional growth and advancement. So things related to not only your professional growth, but your work-life balance or social or advocacy. And so um, the vision is really for empowering women to be their best. And we will have, uh, and I'll ask just really quick for at least the... Um, advisory group or the team members to just stand and let me recognize you real quick. The co-leads are Jill Bryan Bova and uh, Kathy Carlson, who's probably out in the back, and uh, Bill Watkins, Sandra Davis, and then Jay McCowan. Oh, I don't know if she's here or not. And then Leah Jacobs has really been great from Human Resources and helping um, the group along as well. We will have our inaugural kickoff, and I, I'm a, the executive sponsor for the group, and we'll have the inaugural launch on March, it's on the screen. Uh, 20th. 20th, okay. And um, so we invite you to come. Hopefully Donna Sullenberger knew that we are all actually honoring you <laughs> <laughs> with the new Trailblazer <laughs> Award. And um, this ceremony, we will also spend some time, we have Dr. Paula, Paula uh, Summerlee, who will do a exhibit on the history of women at UTMB and um, how women have really been exceptional here. So we hope you can join us. There are flyers when you go out to grab one, and you'll get an event, event right um, as well. Women's Leadership Network has existed for a few years now. We are a, a group of 22 men and women um, who meet almost monthly and design um, panel discussions such as this. We have mentoring circles going on. We have both formal and informal um, sponsors and mentors and coaches. Uh, our focus is really to elevate young female professionals who want to take that next step. And I think there's a lot of young men and women across our organization who really want the uh, mentorship and coaching that senior leaders can offer them. They often don't know where to go to get that kind of help. And so Women's Leadership Network is that avenue. I believe there's information about Women's Leadership Network on your way out. Thank you very much. I think this was a really great event. Um, thank you for turning out on such a great day. Hope you have a good rest of the day. Give our panelists your applause, please. Thank you, Dr. UTMB Health. Working together to work wonders. <laughs>